Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you all very much for coming. To uh, my name is Tom Morgan, by the way, uh, and I am the director of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at at Saint Scholastica. As I said, thanks so much for coming. This is the third in a series of four programs uh, engendered by the remark that Madeleine Albright made a few years ago on the Today Show that America is the indispensable nation. So we have uh, a third speaker tonight who will, at least his remarks will be inspired by me or Madeleine Albright or both to respond to that. Um, we have a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. If you're not on our mailing list, we do send out emails, announcements of these things, but we also still believe in the post office. So uh, we have postcards and things that talk about our lecture series as well. Uh, when you came in, you should have gotten one of these flyers. I hope you did. Uh, after every lecture, as many of you know, we like to have a, uh, a session, just us, without our featured speaker, to try to talk about it and analyze it a little bit and respond to what we've heard. Um, uh, this, this, uh, time, this time, the talk back will be uh, conducted by my colleague and friend, Randall Poole, uh, and his biography, his credentials are on this uh, sheet of paper. Uh, oftentimes, we have our talk back sessions in somewhere off campus, but this time we'll try, we thought we'd do it on campus. And you'll notice, I hope, on your material that the day Tuesday is crossed out, it should be, and it should say Monday, February 3rd. I just noticed this morning that this Tuesday, February 4th, is caucus day, and we can't compete with that, nor should we. So Randall was, uh, was very generous and willing to move that one day, uh, Monday night, for the talk back on this. After the lecture, uh, of course, you're invited to come up to these microphones here and ask questions. Uh, new rule in these lecture series, students first. Please defer to the students, let them ask questions, and then, and then you community people are welcome, welcome to ask questions as well. Uh, this whole series, and this one in particular, is of course sponsored by the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at St. Scholastica and funded in part by, <clears throat> excuse me, by the Warner Lecture Series of the Manitou Fund, the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Evra Foundation, and by Mary C. Van Evra in memory of William Van Evra, a former trustee of the college. Additional support has been received also by the Reader Weekly of Duluth. I'm very, very grateful to all our sponsors for your continuous support and confidence in what we do here. Thank you very much. Our speaker this evening was born in Tacoma, Washington, earned a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Washington, where he served as editor of the campus newspaper, winning two major awards for student journalism. Following three years in the Army, he earned a master's degree from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, and then he began his career at the Denver Post and then quickly moved on to the National Observer and eventually the Wall Street Journal, where he covered Congress, the White House, economic policy, and national politics, including three presidential campaigns. From there, he went to Congressional Quarterly, where he was president and editor-in-chief, a position he held for 12 years, following 10 years as head of that publishing company's editorial unit. Mr. Mary has also written and written, written widely for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, the National Review, the American Spectator, and the National Interest. He's appeared on Meet the Press, Face the Nation, Newsmakers, and many other such TV news programs. Currently, he is the political editor of the National Interest. Mr. Mary is the author of four books, and I'm going to name them all. You can see a pattern in these books. First one is Taking on the World, Joseph and Stuart Alsop, Guardians of the American Century. 
Second book, Sands of Empire, Missionary Zeal, American Foreign Policy, and the Hazards of Global Ambition. Following that, we have A Country of Vast Designs, James K. Polk, The Mexican War and the Conquest of the American Continent. And most recently, Where They Stand, American Presidents in the Eyes of Voters and Historians. All or most of these books, I think, will be on sale after the lecture in the um, foyer afterwards. I should add that he's current, he tells me he's currently working on a book that he's pretty excited about. I can tell about, um, about President McKinley and uh, the Spanish-American War and America's entry onto the world stage as a global power. Uh, currently, Mr. Mary lives in Whidbey Island, north of Seattle with Susan, his wife, who is a retired executive. They have two daughters. They're both living in Washington, D.C., and they're both in the publishing business, the family business. And their son uh, lives in Denver, who is a software engineer. Oh, they also have two grandchildren, uh, Elliot, who is three, and Maisie, who is seven. Outside of this heavy, heady world of politics and writing and journalism, Mr. Mary enjoys long distance biking, biking alpine and cross country skiing, and water sports. He's recently taken up stand up paddle boarding. Ladies and gentlemen, please met, welcome Mr. Robert W. Mary. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. I particularly a pleasure to be on this uh, wonderful, wonderful campus. And I will tell you that I uh, had a little trouble getting here. I, I waited at the Minneapolis airport for uh, two and a half hours. I thought it was going to be maybe half an hour to get on the airplane, and then another three hours on the plane before we took off. So um, it was really a pleasure uh, to come here and see all these wonderfully smiley, happy faces. Um, which is almost as uh, uh, mandatory as the wine I had uh, at dinner just before we got here. Um, I flew in from Washington, D.C., where it was a balmy 13 degrees. I'm, I'm such an idiot, I thought it was cold. <laughs> but um, in political terms, I've learned about Washington. I've been there. I was there for 40 years. I still maintain a residence there. Um, that it could be described as uh, a place that, that's, whose motto is where there's smoke, there's mirrors. <laughs> now, I must confess to a certain ignorance related to the Cold War. I'm going to talk about foreign policy, and we might begin with the Cold War and the end of the Cold War. I saw it as an epic ideological and geo geopolitical struggle between Russian Bolshevism and its various offshoots and Western civilization. And it's clear that at the end of World War II, Western Europe was mortally threatened by the Soviet Union and its client states, which had 1.3 million troops parked on the basic frontier of Western Europe and had pretty much taken over or was in the process of taking over Eastern Europe. And if America had demonstrated weakness, I don't think there's any question that Europe would be gone. But it didn't happen largely because of the heroic presidency of Harry S. Truman, in my view. Greece and Turkey, the support there, Marshall Plan, the Berlin Airlift, the creation of the CIA and the Defense Department. He successfully stared down Stalin. And the Soviets kind of concluded after probably around 1948, well, that didn't work. We, we, the cost is too high. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to find, we can't pick off Europe like a right plum. So we're going to come up with another strategy. We're going to basically undermine Western interests all around the world, wherever we can do it, in places like Korea and Vietnam and Cuba and Latin America and Africa and the Middle East. And that was the strategy right up to the end of the Cold War with Angola and Nicaragua and other things. It was a very smart strategy on the part of the Soviets because they can pick and choose areas of vulnerability, whereas the West, America particularly, had to man these battlements wherever they might be, wherever they could be threatened. And it did lead to some hot wars, as we all know, Korea and Vietnam, which had some messy results and some messy um, periods. Um, but 
Ultimately, the counter-strategy prevailed. And under Reagan primarily, in my view, uh, who challenged the Soviet Union to an economic duel, we won the Cold War and it was over. And here's where my ignorance emerges because I thought in all of my naivete that America now, at the result of this great grand victory after 40 years, was the preeminent power upon the globe that there was no combination of countries that could really challenge us in any significant way, and therefore, we could relax a bit. We still had to be in the world. We still had to be very, very vigilant. We had to uh, uh, pursue, I think, just intrinsically, three fundamental global challenges. We had to protect U.S. interests. We had to protect the interests of the West because we were ultimately the core state of the West. We were the military custodian of Western civilization, particularly Europe, primarily Europe. And we had, to, uh, we had to assume the responsibility of maintaining stability in key strategic locations around the world. I thought this was a pretty big, pretty big menu. Um, and so that therefore there was no real need to sort of venture forth into the world searching for dragons to destroy, to use the words of John Quincy Adams. And yet, it never really happened that way. By 1992, it was pretty significantly apparent that there was a powerful strain of Wilsonian interventionism that was grabbing hold of the American consciousness. Foreign policy driven by humanitarian impulses. It began in Somalia at the end of 1992 when George Herbert Walker Bush sent 28,000 troops. 28,000 troops is a lot of troops to be sending halfway around the world into Somalia uh, to feed starving Somalians who were beleaguered as a result of a lot of internal strife and warlordism that had gripped that country for quite some time. And it, this was, however, unprecedented because always before when America had sent a contingent of troops to that, uh, in that kind of a, a climate or an environment, there had, been, there had been some kind of, of pretense, at least, or a debate about whether that action represented uh, an effort to protect America's national interests. But in Somalia, George Herbert Walker Bush made it very clear it had nothing to do with American interests. We're doing this for purely humanitarian grounds. And it generated a great deal of enthusiasm. Time Magazine, I'm gonna use Time a little bit, but it's only sort of representative of a lot of other publications. It wrote at that time, um, it, it said it was, it was a precedent, it was unprecedented as I thought. I was sort of negative on the precedent. Time Magazine was very enthusiastic. Anyone who raises questions risks being labeled heartless. When I read that, I, I remember thinking, gosh, Who's going to label me heartless? And then it occurred to me, well, the editors of Time Magazine for a start. And Time then also wrote, nor is there a case against a moral standard in diplomacy. Using might in the name of humanitarianism is an estimable goal. So here again, they're saying that there's not even a debate. There's not even a discussion about this. It's just clear. There's not a case against well, even after the Somalia adventure under Bill Clinton turned into a disaster and embarrassment, remember Black Hawk Down, the liberal interventionists, the people who adopted this Wilsonian sensibility, immediately wanted to leverage it into the Balkans, where a tragic warfare was taking place uh, of little strategic significance to the world, and certainly not to America and very little to the West. Um, it was a very agonizing thing to watch, however. And Time wrote on its cover, right after Bill Clinton took office, if Somalia, why not Bosnia? And later it wrote that Americans needed to understand, and this is a quote, that their children and their billions should be spent on Bosnia. I found myself wondering, in our system with a voluntary army and uh, 
um, the elites of, uh, of the Northeast, including the editors of Time Magazine, not really having to serve in the military anymore, uh, whether it was likely that any editors of Time Magazine would see their children spent on Bosnia. And I concluded there was almost no chance whatsoever of that. And then came 9-11, and this sentiment almost immediately became fused with the hegemonic impulses of major U.S. nationalists and the neoconservative elements who had a sense of American hegemony around the world. And I thought at the time, there's no telling where this will lead, and I was struck by the extent to which there was so little debate about it. Well, we know where it led. It led directly to Iraq. Uh, and the rationale for Iraq, there were really two of them. What we hear an awful lot about how there was a rationale of necessity because Saddam Hussein had supposedly had weapons of mass destruction and was playing cozy with Islamist extremists. Both of those things turned out to be untrue. But that was the, that was the false rationale of necessity. But what struck me in the run-up to the war was the rationale of success. In other words, okay, if you think there's a necessity, I was skeptical, but I couldn't possibly know. Um, but how are you going to succeed? How are you going to prevent this from becoming another quagmire type of a situation um, where you get hold of something overseas and you can't let go? And the rationale of success was the idea that America was going to spread democracy into Iraq. It was going to sort of inject it like a doctor may do to sort of inoculate you. Um, and that democracy was going to emerge in Iraq. Um, and after the invasion, at the beginning of the occupation, I concluded that this isn't really a debate. Looking at it, trying to get up high, trying to understand what this debate is all about, if there was a debate, not really between left and right, because they were both split on the issue, or conservatives and liberals, or Republicans and Democrats, for that matter, that it was really bigger than that. And so I identified, and that's what led me to write the book Sands of Empire, that Tom asked me to sort of bring some thoughts forward from that book for purposes of this discussion. And I concluded that it was really a philosophical debate of epic proportions, ultimately between two fundamental and opposing Western views of history. One we'll call the famous Western idea of progress, centuries in the making, probably began around the 13th century. Um, where it had its first stirrings and developed in thinking in many, many ways through that period uh, into the era of Western global dominance. The other I call cycles of history or the cyclical view of history, which is very, very different from the idea of progress. So let's talk about the two of them and then see if we can't figure out how this convergence of these two ideas is still with us in debates, even though people aren't really thinking in these terms as they go about their daily political lives. The idea of progress can be stated very simply, but it has profound implications. Ultimately, it is the idea that the story of mankind is the story of a very long, inevitable progression of man from cultural backwardness, blindness, and folly to ever higher levels of civilization and enlightenment, and that this progress will continue because it's part of the human condition. So as long as man survives on earth, mankind survives on earth, man will continue to progress. And the crucial element here is it applies to all mankind. That was very, very significant as it developed over the centuries, and whole books have been written about the idea of progress. Now it seems simple, and in fact, to some extent, it's a truism, and we all know that knowledge is cumulative, especially scientific knowledge, and that as this knowledge accumulates, it can have a huge impact on human comfort and man's ability to control his environment and his circumstances. We all know, for example, that horse-drawn transportation led to steam and steam to internal combustion and that to jet propulsion. But the significance goes far beyond that. Robert Nisbet, who's a uh, a great uh, intellectual of the, um, up until I think he died maybe in the uh, mid to late 80s or early 90s, 
uh, but a major intellectual of his time, wrote, no single idea has been more important than, perhaps as important as, the idea of progress in Western civilization. But along the way, this simple concept picked up what I consider to be two contradictions and what I consider also to be a mischievous corollary. So let's talk about contradiction number one. It centers on the fact that the idea of progress was seen as being part of the human condition, that it will last forever, continue as long as mankind exists on Earth. Around the 18th century, this part of the idea of progress began to leave a lot of intellectuals cold, kind of especially in France. Because I kept asking, well, okay, where's it going? I mean, if we don't know where it goes, how do we know it's even progress? How do we know it's going to be good? So that led more and more of these people to sort of embrace the idea of progress and then say, it's actually leading to an end point. And I happen to know what it is because it's my vision of nirvana on Earth. And so we come to various utopian dreams and Marxist classist societies and racialist theories and various gauzy human culminations that many philosophers brought forward in the West, indicating that this is where progress was going. And by the way, this culmination has my stamp on it. This is what I believe is the ultimate end of progress. Contradiction number two, and this was something that was very hard for Western philosophers to get around, that all of this progress that uh, was sort of led to this idea of progress was largely Western. Because the West, during this time from about 1500 onward, was basically emerging as the world's dominant civilization, economically, technologically, militarily, intellectually. And people in the West over time couldn't help noticing, well, you know, we are progressing, and it does apply to all mankind, but I can't help noticing that these other civilizations, they're not really getting with the program here. They're sort of messing up. And the result was what I call sort of a codicil it will apply to all mankind, was the emergent thinking, as soon as everyone else embraces Western ways and Western values and Western cultures. And they have to do this in order to redeem the idea of progress and all of its ultimate glory. In other words, other peoples of the world had to become more like us. And the result is what we call, uh, what we refer to as uh, the West as a universal culture, Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism's second cousin is American exceptionalism. And it gets right to the Madeleine Albright quote. Um, now, the mischievous corollary, and here's where I have some very strong feelings about it, is when the idea of progress, the philosophers of the idea began to think that it's not just scientific knowledge, which it, we all know is cumulative, and the added human comfort that comes with that, but it could actually apply to human nature, that with the right laws and structures and policies, you can actually improve, maybe even perfect, human nature itself, change human nature for the good. And then, I mean, if you could do that, then there's no reason why you couldn't create peace and tranquility throughout the world. As an aside, I'll just say this is kind of a pivotal concept because in American politics and American political philosophy, conservatives generally consider human nature to be immutable. It doesn't change, whereas liberals consider it to be more malleable to one extent or another on both sides. And that forms a significant element of the debate between liberals and conservatives. Now, this latest version of improving human nature was largely came from the French. The Anglo-Saxon thinking pretty much rejected it during that time. Um, the time of the American Revolution, for example, our thinking was far, far different from the thinking of the French philosophes and the encyclopedists, Rousseau. Rousseau is a good example who thought that mankind was essentially born pristine and that society had corrupted him and if you could just change society and had to do it by force sometimes and maybe have to kill a few people along the way, then mankind could return to its pristine nature. He talked about the reign of virtue. His views did not really create any kind of a reign of virtue, but they helped contribute to elements of the French Revolution that were known as the reign of terror. 
Now, what's the second great Western view of history, what I call cycles of history? It is that, that his, the story of mankind is not a unified human story of linear progress, but rather the story of distinct and discrete civilizations, each with its own culture that emerged, developed, flowered, and then inevitably declined. So it's not just mankind as a whole going in this direction. It is a story of civilizations rising and falling over the course of the history of man on Earth. The two great exponents of this view of history in the 20th century were Oswald Spengler and Arnold Toynbee, and I won't go into their philosophies. Politically, they were poles apart. Toyn uh, uh, Spengler was a kind of uh, dark German romantic of, of, of the, sort of the folk, folk tradition, whereas uh, Toynbee was a uh, Western liberal Democrat um, and ultimately sh sh sort of moving towards um, um, views of the v value of Christianity in, in uh, s sort of uh, salvaging civilization. But in terms of their view of history and how it unfolded, they were very, very convergent. And there are very, various ideas that flow from this, that culture is a powerful force and that it can't just be artificially altered or changed. There is no universal culture because these civilizations have their own cultures and it can't be imposed. One culture can impose, one civilization can impose its culture upon another, either through cajolery or force or any other way. All civilizations will decline, including the West. Both of them felt that the West was in decline. And they, all, and they both felt, and other people who are exponents of this view, felt that the idea of progress was fundamentally wrong. Toynbee captured it pretty well when he talked about, quote, the misconception of the unity of history involving the assumption that there's only one river of civilization, our own, and all others are either tributary to it or else lost in the desert sands. So here we have the two views of history. And at the end of the Cold War, as intellectuals and thinkers and journalists um, people writing for the National Interest magazine that I recently edited um, and, and Foreign Affairs and others were grappling with the concept of, okay, that was a pivotal time in America, in, in, the, in the history of the world, it's over, what's going to replace it? And the two ideas that emerged basically came both from the progress idea and the cyclical view. The idea of progress was captured brilliantly uh, by a young academic who was utterly unknown, who wrote a piece that was published in a young magazine that was utterly unknown, The National Interest, the magazine that I later edited. Uh, and they both became, got on the map as a result of this piece. And he called it the end of history. And he said that Western democratic capitalism, now that the Soviet Union and communism has been totally discredited, had reached a culmination point. It was the culmination of mankind's civic development. It was all over. That's how you get to the idea that we're at the end of history and that the ideological struggles of the world had reached absolute finality. Now, this generated a huge amount of debate and discussion, um, and the national interest had uh, next issue all kinds of people. Uh, Irving Kristol wrote, I don't, I don't believe a word of it. And he said something very interesting in that essay um, in which he, he essentially embraced, not consciously or at least not explicitly, maybe consciously, uh, the cyclical view in which he said, um, all forms of government um, decline. All forms of government, whether you're talking about democracies or or dictatorships, or oligarchies, or whatever, are going to decline. And when I wrote my book, when I read that, it, 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 it reminded me of the poem Ozymandias by Shelley. Remember that poem about the, about the great Egyptian king? And he says, look on my works in despair, um, all ye people. And there was a huge statue to him. And now it's just basically sunken into the sands. 
of Arabia because what he thought was immutable, what he had created, uh, basically decayed into nothing. And um, so that's why I called that book Sands of Empire. But um, what, what uh, Fukuyama said was that, that this Cold War victory had, was going to have a profound impact on world peace because the big wars were now over. He couldn't see where, where the wars could come from because he could only see, apparently, sort of the Cold War kind of wars. Um, and I guess previous to that, the kinds of wars that existed in the West, in which essentially uh, the countries of the West were trying to determine what was going to be their position vis-a-vis -vis the other countries and who was going to dominate the West. Spenker, by the way, argued that the West was in decline in terms of its what he called the cultural phase, which was the phase of cultural health, but that the new civilizational phase was the phase of Western power and force when West moves out into the world and, and becomes empirical. And uh, he thought that there was a huge epic struggle over who was going to dominate the West, Great Britain with its sensibility or Germany with its. Uh, and, and he felt that Germany was going to win. He, he was writing just about the time of World War I. And he saw this coming, and he said that Germany was going to win, and that therefore Germany was going to dominate the West as it moved into the civilizational phase. Well, he made a big miscalculation, as did a lot of other Germans, and that is he didn't calculate Anglo-Saxon America, which was going to align itself with the English sensibility and crush uh, Germany, and that therefore it was going to be the other side that was going to dominate the West. And the question that we face today, and I wrote a piece about this in the, in the National Interest, is is that America now? Is America, as we go into the world and, 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 and take actions that can be described as seeking hegemony, is that, is, is Sping, does Spengler kind of identify that and it turns out to be us? I don't know the answer, but it seems to me to be a kind of a provocative question. So now Fukuyama said, look, there are going to be hold, holdouts of this basic end of history in places like he said North Korea and Cambridge, Massachusetts, but largely, um, largely it's over. And it's clear that the Fukuyama view that got so much attention emanates from the idea of progress. Just consider this quote when he talked about the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. Now the two contradictions Predictions that I identify in the idea of progress are in stark form right here, Eurocentrism and the utopianism. Another element of this uh, way of thinking after the Cold War was this whole concept of globalization, which um, basically was the view that there's a global convergence going on, a convergence of politics and economics and cultures and peoples, um, all essentially, however, under the American model. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, a great deal of truth in this. A lot of this stuff is happening, but a lot of it is not necessarily the end point of history and then it can be undone with the economic significant, global economic dislocation, for example, and other things. One of the great exponents that I talk about in the book uh, is, uh, of this is uh, Thomas Friedman, the New York Times, a brilliant journalist an and analyst um, who wrote that, uh, that, who wrote a great deal in, in a book called The Lexus and the Olive Tree about how this convergence was coming about and that, and that other, all the peoples of the world were going to have to embrace the American system uh, or they were going to be left behind. Pardon me. So, in, in intellectual terms, and I'm not just talking about intellectuals talking to intellectuals, these are, these are books that were bestsellers that generated a lot of discussion and interest and debate. Um, the uh, idea of progress found its echo in some very, very powerful writings. Meanwhile, the cyclical view was embraced, not explicitly, but clearly, by the great uh, late great Samuel P. Huntington, 
political science professor of Harvard, who probably was the premier political scientist of his generation. And he wrote a famous essay. It was published in uh, Foreign Affairs, later expanded into a book called Clash of Civilizations. And what he said, well, the essay was in, the, uh, in, in Foreign Affairs, I said, but with the, with the end of the Cold War, there was going to be a, a surge of intense competition and frictions among the world's civilizations and also cultural clashes within the civilizations and nations. Um, and he said that uh, the Cold War kind of froze this, but these cultural sensibilities uh, are very powerful and very strong, and they come out of these, you know, civilizational identity, and that it was inevitable that there was going to be clashes uh, among uh, these uh, uh, civilizations protecting and projecting uh, their particular cultures, which they are very attached to. And that, um, so if you talk about intense competition and frictions, he pretty much predicted that there was going to be a, a sort of a resurgence of conflict and, and, and uh, tension between the world of Islam and the West, particularly America. With, with regard to cultural clashes within civilizations, he talked in his book, for example, about Ukraine. Well, we're reading a lot in the headlines about Ukraine today. Um, and it's projected in the media largely, I think erroneously, as kind of, there's the people in Ukraine, there's the leaders of Ukraine who were oligarchs and they want to maintain power. And uh, then there are the people who want democracy. That's not really what's going on in Ukraine. What's going on in Ukraine is Ukraine is a, 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 is a divided nation. It is, it is not quite half, but a significant proportion in the eastern part of the country are mostly Russian, ethnic Russians. They speak Russian. Uh, they belong to the Orthodox Church. And their sensibility, their sort of their, their outlook, um, sort of gravitates, and they look towards Russia because that's their heritage. In the western part of the country, it's western, it's Catholic, and uh, they tend to view uh, the world more in terms of western view. So, so this country is, a, is what um, um, Huntington called a cleft country, and it's struggling with this, and it's gonna continue to struggle with it because it's one of these conflicts. It gets back to one of the things that Sam Huntington said about these cultural clashes. They're very difficult to adjudicate. They're difficult to negotiate because if, you're, if, you're, if it's a, a territorial dispute, you can always sort of split the difference somewhere. If it's, even if it's an ideological dispute, like the Cold War, I mean, ultimately, um, you know, you can, you know, the side that loses can sort of give in. But when you're talking about culture, the immutable force of culture, it's very hard for peoples to give up or to um, um, relinquish uh, their identity or their heritage. And therefore, these clashes tend to be more intense and they tend to be much more, they tend to be more ongoing. So some of Huntington's conclusions, aside from that one, he said that relative to other civilizations, if you just look at history and how this has worked over the course of history, the West clearly is in decline. The, the world is moving into, it's becoming a multipolar, multi-civilizational world. The West is not a universal culture. In fact, there is no universal culture and there can't be. So he this is right out of, out of uh, Spengler. He talks about the importance of core states. And by core states, he means the central states, the, the, the guiding force of the various civilizations. For the West, of course, it's the United States of America. For the for the uh, cynic or the Asian civilization, it is uh, China. Uh, for the Hindu civilizations, it's India. For um, the um, Orthodox, it's Russia. And these core states act as sort of um, disciplinarians within the civilization, try to keep some order. And they also, they're interlocutors with other civilizations, with the core states of other civilizations. And that leads to a certain stability if the core states are operating the way they ought. He said that unfortunately, Islam has no core state. And that's, that's a problem. And I think that that, I think he identified a very significant reality that has uh, affected the course of history over the course of the last 10 or 12 years. <clears throat> 
Now, let's go back to the beginning of the post-war, post-Cold War era, when I stupidly thought that we could sort of pull back a little bit and not get ourselves involved in unnecessary wars. There's no question that the idea of progress was in the driver's seat in terms of driving the American foreign policy sensibility. Um, because first there was the Wilsonian interventionism that emerged under two guises. First, to apply American power in behalf of all mankind. That led to, that led to um, um, the, um, uh, our involvement in Bosnia. It led to our involvement in uh, Somalia. Ultimately, it undergirded um, what we were doing and saying in, uh, in Iraq. And there was also the idea of spreading American democracy as a formula for peace. And under the Bush administration, this American nationalism and hegemony of the neocons kind of merge with that. So that you get in, um, in Iraq, you get uh, what I call the, the uh, rationale of success. And uh, the, the, the rationale of imperative. I think I've already talked about that, didn't I? I'm sorry? I did. Thank you. So, um, so we had the, the neoconservative view, which was that America needed to take this moment, the unipolar moment, as Charles Crothammer called it, and leverage it and basically dominate the world. Um, and if you believe that, then it's natural that you would, you would support um, the Iraq invasion, and even after there were no weapons of mass destruction and there was no evidence of collusion with uh, Islamist fundamentalists or terrorists, um, and we see what uh, happened and didn't really unfold like it was advertised, nevertheless, they would feel a need to defend it because that's all part of that hegemonic out outlook. So the strategy in Iraq was to establish the democratic regime which was going to serve as a beachhead for further Middle Eastern democratization, and in doing that, establish a friendliness towards the United States that could be leveraged for further diplomatic initiatives in the region. So the idea was we were going to transform the Middle East. Pretty much, not, it's not fair to say, it's often said an image of the United States or an image of Western democracy. Mm, probably not exactly, but sort of going in that direction. And this is all idea of progress, and it all proved um, very elusive or frivolous. So why? Well, I think, in part, it's because it ignored the power of the cultural forces and the sectarian animosities. In Iraq, for example, the country, it's not really a country, it's artificially created by the West after World War I, but the country as it became, um, and that area uh, had been totally dominated by Sunnis ever since the Turks, the Ottomans, moved into that area, uh, I don't know how many centuries ago, 600, 800 years ago. Uh, and they were Sunni, and they were not going to let the Shiites uh, dominate that, in part because Iran, Iran next door was Shiite. And then as more and more Shiites moved into the area, it became more and more brutal in order for the Sunnis to dominate the area. But the Brits came along and created Iraq, and they took one look at this and looked to, saw Iran next door, and they said, we agree. The Sunnis are going to dominate. And then the Brits were kind of, they kind of created the, 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 uh, the kings, and the kings were all Sunni, so they basically adopted the same thing. And then the kings were overthrown for the dictators all the way up to Saddam Hussein, and they were doing the same thing. What George W. Bush did was he basically said, I don't think he even thought about it, I don't think he even understood this. He said, I'm going to upend this after all these centuries. And what he didn't understand was this is going to unleash all kinds of questions. The Sunnis were not going to go quietly into that night. Uh, it, was going to, it was going to create an alliance uh, uh, that could never happen under the old regimes uh, between Iran and Iraq, which was going to totally change the balance of power in the region. 
And yet all of that uh, took place um, without, uh, you know, it was totally um, unrelated to this vision and this dream of establishing democracy in Iraq. Um, and so it demonstrated an ignorance of the regime's history. And it, it manifested a, a, a sense to which the, the administration was beguiled by this vision of American hegemony conceived and fueled by American exceptionalism. As Madeleine Albright also said, we stand taller than other nations and therefore we see further. Now, I have to say that if you look at Iraq today, uh, I guess we could have a debate about it, but uh, my own view is that, that, that what we set out to do in Iraq has been a, an abject failure. Um, and um, it has a long ways to play out, but it's not going to be pretty. It's not pretty what's going on there now. In Afghanistan, what began as an initial modest goal, basically upend the Taliban and make sure that uh, it wasn't run by a government to the extent that Afghanistan could ever have any kind of a central government, which isn't much, by the way, um, that is not going to invite al-Qaeda to essentially metastasize in that space. Uh, but then the mission became expanded um, and, and it was judged that we were going to undo hundreds of years of history and cultural habit and practice um, by essentially moving into the countryside and supersede the Taliban in Afghan society. Well, it, it didn't happen, it's not happening, and it's not going to happen. Uh, some people remember their history in terms of the Brits. The Brits um, felt that uh, in, the, in, the, in the 19th century, they were deathly afraid that Russia was going to sweep down and, and um, take over the jewel and the crown of the empire, which was India, and that they were going to come through Afghanistan. So the, the Brits uh, said on two occasions in the 19th century, 1840s, I know, for the first one in the first Afghan war, and I think the second one was 1870s, or maybe the 1880s, I'm not sure, in which they um, were going to go into Afghanistan themselves to fortify the area and make sure that the Russians uh, couldn't come through. Totally unnecessary. I mean, we know from what happened 100 years later that the Russians were not going to be able to get to India through Afghanistan, um, and the Brits were not able to protect uh, India from Afghanistan because in the first Afghan war in the 1840s, uh, they sent a bunch of troops in there and, and their families and, and uh, upended the government, Taliban government and, and installed their guy, and, and uh, there was a tremendous revolt, and they were all killed except for one doctor. They decided, they we've got to get out of here, and they were just killed on the way out except for one doctor who made it in a haggard horse um, uh, to back to uh, uh, British civilization. Uh, and uh, probably he was allowed uh, uh, to survive so that he could uh, live to tell the story. Um, so that's Afghanistan. And uh, any nation that thinks it's gonna control the countryside of Afghanistan is probably fooling itself. What about Egypt? Ah, we thought, here we have a chance for real democracy. We just get those bad military guys in their place, notwithstanding the fact that we had cozed it up to them over years. Um, but so what do we get? Well, first we got the triumph of the Muslim Brotherhood through elections, by the way. Um, and then we got the return of the military guys um, through upending of an election in which the United States demonstrated a sort of selective embrace of democracy and manifested what I have to call official US hypocrisy. Um, I mean, my own view is, I'm not sure the United States should be in the business of trying to create democracies around the world. I think we should be supporting the democracy. I think that we should, we should value them and we should, um, we should highlight them. Uh, but I'm not sure we can create them. Um, but um, in the case of, uh, of Egypt, we essentially embraced the upending of an election. And I mean, the first element of any democracy is elections. But the rationale was, you, you all heard it, well, democracy is more than just elections. Well, maybe, but there's no democracy without elections. And so if they can be upended, then you, you're not going to be any democracy. And there's no democracy in Egypt, and there's not going to be. The, 
the, uh, the military is back in control, as it was uh, since Nasser. Libya, another chance for real democracy. Instead, we unleashed internal strife that's still going on. We sent masses of weapons into the hands of Islamic radicals used in Benghazi and, and uh, into Syria and other places in Africa. We destabilized the nation. And again, I have to say, I was uncomfortable with the U U.S. blatantly reneging on an agreement it had with a foreign leader, Gaddafi, who essentially said, look, I'll give up these weapons of mass destruction or any effort to build them, and I'll be a good boy, but don't, please don't, uh, you know, don't go after me. Don't upend my regime. We said, fine. Um, and then as soon as he was weak, weakened, uh, we jumped on. So overall, the region has been destabilized. It's more hostile to the United States than ever before. Islamic fundamentalism has spread further, although I was interested in uh, um, Barack Obama's, um, I, I think very interesting, it was, I don't know if you've seen the piece in New Yorker by David Remnick, it's a long, long piece. He spent a lot of time with Obama and it's a probing, fascinating piece. But he says something interesting when, uh, when Rebnik said, well, wait a minute, There's, isn't Al-Qaeda even spread you know, all much further than it was before when it was just in Afghanistan? And he said, uh, he said well, you know, when the, when the, when the JV uh, puts, on the, puts on the uniform of the, I don't know, whatever team he's talking about, it doesn't mean that they're a professional um, football team or basketball team or whatever. So what he was saying is that, yes, it has spread, but they're they don't have the reach and the scope that they had. And that, that may be true, but nevertheless, it has spread out. Um, and uh, the U.S. has appeared somewhat hapless at times in the course of this policy matrix. Um, so I might suggest that perhaps we would inject just a little bit of a dose of the cyclical view that Islam is its own culture um, that we should respect it for what it is, recognizing that it has been at loggerheads with the West for many, many centuries, and um, that, that we, we, we will not make efforts to proselytize uh, the people of Islam or their leaders into how they should be or conduct themselves. Well, Make it, let them police their own region. And terrorism directly, directed specifically against the US will be met with devastating response, including against sponsoring nations. Um, and it goes back to sort of my view of what America might have adopted as its rationale for foreign policy thinking at the, at the beginning of the post-Cold War period that it must protect its own national interests, wherever those might be. It had to protect the West, although the West doesn't, Europe is not threatened in any significant way, so this doesn't really amount to very much, but nevertheless, we're the core state of the West and we have to recognize that. And we have to maintain stability in the key locations of the world where they could be threatened because we are the most powerful nation in the world. In that vein, the question about the United States and China going forward is a totally different ball game in my view. This, this is one uh, where America's interest in being in Asia, we're a Pacific power, and uh, we've, uh, I think we've done very well in Asia uh, in terms of maintaining our, our power there in an even-handed and, and disinterested and basically um, uh, fair-minded manner. Um, and uh, China, I think, has visions of essentially kicking us out of there. Um, and I think that's a serious matter, uh, unlike some of these other things I've been talking about. So what does all this add up to? Well, it, add up, it adds up to just about my allotment of time, actually. But um, it adds up to maybe a policy more in keeping with the words, uh, different words of John Quincy Adams, who... I think was a brilliant analyst of foreign policy. And he said this, he said, America is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. <laughs>
I think that that's a pretty good standard, and I think it could serve as well in the post-Cold post War era. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take some questions from all of you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Right on time, too. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Mary. And uh, before we take the questions, I just want to remind you again, uh, I think you gave us a lot to think about and talk about, and we're meeting Monday night, 7 p.m., 1115, under the leadership of wherever he is, Randall Poole, will help us conduct the discussions. Okay, now Q&A, and remember, students go first. Students have questions, I hope. Yeah, here's one, okay. Hello, Mr. Ma Hello, Mr. Meredy. Hello. Thank you, thank you for your speech. Uh, I have a question. What message would you provide to future generations of Americans with respect to cultural pluralism? Should the cyclical view hold true and the Western notion of progress fail? I'm sorry, just say, say, say that one more time. What, what would I su suggest to future ge generations? Okay, okay. Um, well, I, you know, I, the, we, we must not and cannot reject the idea of progress. The idea of progress is a reality, and we all want progress, and we want all the things that progress represents. It's when progress it, it takes on these contradictions and the mischievous corollary that, in, in my view, it, be, it, it tends to lead us astray. And so I think the lesson would be that we don't want to be led astray. And we have in this country a tremendous tradition of, of intellectual thinking uh, that goes along with that, goes along with the idea that, that we're not going to remake peoples and that we're not going to change human nature and that we're not going to uh, be able to impose our values on other people from other cultures and other societies and other civilizations. So I, I, I would say that that could just be, in general, a guiding principle. And around that, there's a lot of room for debate and discussion and flexibility in terms of foreign policy. Thank you, I have one more question. Yes. What wisdom would you impart upon those considering enlistment in the armed services, given the seemingly poor long-term consideration offered to our current foreign policies and armed conflicts? I didn't understand that last part. Uh, given... Given the seemingly poor long-term consideration, offered to our foreign policies and armed conflicts, specifically in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you're saying kind of the endless war, you're talking about the, the ongoing war. Well, I have tremendous respect. I served in the military, I didn't serve in combat. Uh, I, I was in Europe in uh, intelligence work, but um, I, I have tremendous respect for uh, these um, young men and women who are uh, serving their country and these tours, when these young people get sent over for their sixth and seventh and eighth, I just was reading about one guy, his 10th tour. Um, I think there's something wrong here. Uh, the, you know, in, in Europe, in, in the war in Europe, World War II, it was like for the duration, but the combat in Europe was from, you know, June of 1944 till, you know, about a year later, and a year and a couple months. And um, um, Vietnam, it was uh, 13 months with the r and in between, in Hawaii or someplace. Uh, now these professional soldiers, and I understand that they are professional soldiers and they're volunteers, but they're sent back and back and back, and I think that the damage it's doing to them is palpable, um, and um, I think it's very unfortunate. I don't have any advice for them because I don't have any wisdom to impart to them, but from the standpoint of American society, I think that uh, that's another sort of uh, re um, residue of the policies that we've been pursuing for the last 12 years. Thank you. 20 years. Yes. Hello. Um, hi. Thank you for your talk. It was really informative. I'm actually taking a, a course on this stuff, so it's super interesting to see that I actually understand everything. <laughs> I have a question for you. You, you mentioned uh, a little about um, U.S. Uh, unilateralism, especially regarding like the, the Iraq war in specific, but I would like to see if you can please elaborate a little bit more on it. Um, my 
question per se is protecting natural interest wherever it might be it could mean a lot of things. It could mean having free reign to really say, well, this is my in interest or that is my interest. And that could be potentially a really difficult line to draw. Yeah. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why there could be resentment against U.S. abroad. I think you're absolutely right about that, and I, and I think that you get in you set you get yourself into a situation where um, you can define uh, America's natural interest in very freewheeling ways, um, maybe promiscuously, but uh, I think it needs to be rigorously defined, uh, and it has to be clear and palpable in terms of how it affects America or the world and world stability. Um, and in terms of American unilateralism, I'm not, I, I you know, the, the, the neoconservative sensibility is uh, sort of against alliances and they don't want to talk to anybody who may be a potential enemy. I, I, I'm not like that. I'm, I'm not really, in, I'm, not, I'm not motivated to cede American sovereignty to the United Nations, for example, when America's interests are involved and there are people who, in the debate who tend towards that thinking. Um, but I believe that America should employ very creative and imaginative diplomacy backed up with our capacity to use force, which is all a reality, um, and deal with other nations um, uh, in, in ways that respect their own interests. And I think that our foreign policy has not taken that into account sufficiently. I'll give you an example. US relations with Russia are in tatters right now. Um, and, you know, Putin and Russia has, uh, have contributed to this significantly. But I think we have too. Um, and we, uh, from their view, and I think it's not unreasonable, believe that we uh, have no consciousness or regard for their own particular uh, national interests in which they don't threaten us at all. So that would be one example of what I'm talking about. Thank you for your question. Hi. Um, I liked your point on the cyclical view of history, um, like the rise and fall of all these civilizations, like the Romans, the Ottomans, the British, all these empires that you know, rise and then ultimately crumble. And Chalmers Johnson wrote that you can't maintain an empire abroad and a republic at home as the British proved. So that being said, my question to you is what do you foresee for the American empire trying to maintain an empire abroad and a democracy at home? I guess what would you foresee for that? I think that the imperial impulse uh, carries with it intrinsic threats uh, to democracy, and I think we're seeing that to some extent. I'm not, well, I'm not a apoplectic about the NSA, but I'm concerned about the NSA, and uh, I think that um, when 9-11 happened and we went into this fervor of making sure that, that we're not going to ever let anybody die in a terrorist attack ever again on American soil or anywhere if it's an American, uh, and we're going to do anything within technological capacity to prevent it, I think we skewed things in a direction that is not altogether healthy. Um, and so uh, that's, that's one small example. But look, we have a military industrial complex in this country that is, was, we, we were warned about by Eisenhower in 1960, and um, it is immensely powerful and immensely rich and, and funneling huge amounts of money uh, into politics to protect its weapon systems and its own interests. Um, and uh, I think uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a serious danger to our democracy. So I'd like to see more attention devoted to that. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, here we go. Do you feel that as societies become more inter interconnected through globalism, that it's only natural as societies become more modern and they, they progress that some Western elements become incorporated into their society. For example, because of globalization, uh, societies have seen an increase in wealth, a decline in violence, 
uh, more acceptance towards civil rights, greater gender equality, some of the, a lot of these which have been declared as Western inherently. So I, what I'm asking is, is it necessarily a bad thing if societies incorporate Western values? And I think it's a bit, we should also um, think about whether uh, the US is also um, uh, incorporating values from other cultures, Bollywood movies, uh, Korean music, et cetera. Um, I have, uh I have no objection to any society uh, gravitating towards uh, Western values. Uh, what I am raising questions about is whether America should seek to impose those values, or whether it should go overseas with armies, as it did in Iraq, and conquer countries with the idea of establishing something approaching Western democracy. Um, that's what I think is folly, and I think that the um, we see the folly. I have to say that I'm not sure that I, I mean, there's, all, there's in, in, in our era of globalization, and it's very real, and you describe it very well, um, there's an awful lot of uh, cross-pollination among civilizations and cultures, and I think that that's uh, fine and healthy. Um, I'm uh, less inclined to think that that's moving towards some kind of a convergence of uh, peace and harmony, uh, because I think what we've seen in the world since the end of the Cold War is an awful lot of violence and an awful lot of tension and an awful lot of um, um, conflict. And much of it is the cultural conflict and civilizational conflict. So you don't feel that societies become more interdependent, that peace will result because if you have economic ties with another country, you wouldn't be you know, inclined to declare war on them? The question is whether they become, they, they get to know each other better, they become more independent, uh, more dependent, and that therefore they become more um, 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 uh, accepting of one another? Is that the idea? What I'm saying is that um, uh, as societies become more economically dependent on each other, they don't, ha they don't have an inclination towards war. Be uh, inclination towards war would decrease as societies have, are more economically dependent on each other. I don't see it. I mean, I, it's, to some extent, yes, I think, but I, I don't think it's, I don't think that's the wave of the future. I don't think that's where society goes. I don't think that's where the world goes. And that's not what we've seen since the end of the Cold War, in my view. That's a debatable matter, and reasonable people can disagree. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Uh, you offered this, uh, these two rationales for intervention in Iraq, um, you know, necessity and success. Do you feel that the ideology of liberals and conservatives around that time kind of more like reflected those like individually, like for say like uh, you know the Democrats may have reflected you know uh, success and the you know the conservative ideology at the time may have reflected uh, uh, necessity. Uh, Weapons of mass destruction, like you say. I think you're exact. I think you're exactly right. I think there was a, a, a kind of a convergence, and the the uh, sort of the Wilsonian um, impulse that I described that emerged with Somalia was still very much present. And Bush, Bush. I mean, he didn't get. I mean, a lot of Democrats opposed uh, the Iraq War before, but uh, some supported it. And many of them supported it from the standpoint of this uh, Wilsonian concept. Whereas, if you look at you know people like uh, Vice President Cheney um, or Don Rumsfeld to some extent, uh, they were much more thinking about American power and American hegemony and American dominance for purposes of global stability, and they and they came together. Um, that's my view in terms of, of, of where the debate was at that time. Hi, um, I'm just curious. So since the U.S. has pretty much you know, decimated the Middle East since our involvement in there, um, do you think it's our responsibility to clean that up or should we leave them to their own devices? Well, we, we, you could argue that we have a responsibility, but I don't think we have any capacity to really clean it up, and so I think that we're going to have to leave them to their own devices. Um, I worry about that. 
because I think that uh, what we're seeing in the Middle East is a very significant uh, sectarian conflict uh, that is, uh, it has the capacity, it has the potential to really become Middle Eastern wide. Um, and, you know, some people believe that if, if uh, Iran, for example, could genuinely sort of return to the community of nations, that maybe there could be a kind of a balance of power between the Shia and the Sunnis. But the Sunnis, you know, Saudi Arabia, they don't like that idea at all, and, and uh, they're going to do everything they can to prevent it. So between here and there, we could see a significant amount of strife. Uh, and I, as I say, I, 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 I worry about it a great deal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if, like, if you had any specific ideas of ways to, um, like, help other countries who who are in need as our members of the UN, but um, as as the United States is a member of the United Nations, without implementing like a ton of our own views upon their culture, like. Um, I think that uh, we always there are always going to be nations that we are going to have to. Uh, prop up, but largely when it's in our interest to do so. Um, I think that there are humanitarian um, initiatives uh, through the UN and otherwise. I mean, we give a lot of money uh, to humanitarian causes. George W. Bush uh, sent a lot of money to Africa. He gets a lot of credit, AIDS and other things. Um, I'm not opposed to that. I, 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 worry about, I worry about our financial health in this country uh, a great deal, so that may be cut Come, could come into play, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not intrinsically opposed to that. Um, so yeah, I think we can do that, and I think you can do it in a way that separates that from what you're talking about, the, the um, instinct to impose values on people. Thank you. Um, uh, as, as far as, uh, I, first of all, I, I read Sands of Empire recently, and I very much enjoyed it. It gave, gave me a lot to think about. Um, one of the things that, was, that caused me to think uh, the most is the, the difference between realpolitik and humanitarian intervention or idealistic intervention. And I had a lot of trouble determining the difference sometimes when, for instance, Kissinger insisted on backing Yahya Khan and essentially allowed Yahya Khan to commit a massive genocide in East Pakistan, or, the, or Reagan's Iran-Contra and his insistence on going through with the Strategic Defense Initiative. And, and then I look at 1995 in, in Bosnia, where, you know, after three weeks, of once, the NATO, once NATO started bombing targets there, a genocide was actually stopped. Now, of course, problems occurred, and then the Kosovo intervention wasn't, uh, wasn't great, and Somalia was a disaster. But it seems like when it comes to at least genocide, which happens with way too much frequency, there should be a role that can be played, because genocide seems to be committed by people who are going on a cost-benefit analysis. I can wipe these people out and nobody's going to do anything, and there's a history of nobody doing anything about genocides. So I'm wondering if you think there is room for not overt warfare, but some, some sort of, of response, a human, humanitarian response, even even given the fact that you know there are these cultural differences and these problems, but there are also genocides, and it seems like reasonable ways to stop them. Yeah, I think it's a very, very good question and, and very apt. And I, I have to say that I, um, in, in adopting my realpolitik views, uh, have come to regard genocide as a kind of an exception. I do believe, I will say, however, uh, that that word is, um, I think it's, it's misused, and it's used promiscuously a great deal. Um, I don't think that what was happening in the Balkans was genocide. It was very, very brutal ethnic cleansing. Um, on a couple of examples that you pose, and they're very good examples for purposes of discussion, and I don't have ideological views on these, but the Yaya Khan, the Pakistan thing, you're talking about the 71 war. Yeah. 
Um, a, a recent book has been written that uh, is very, very uh, devastating against uh, Kissinger, uh, takes him to task. Uh, there was a really interesting essay in the National Interest Magazine that came out in the last issue, it's the current issue. Um, uh, it's sort of attempting to dissect that in a way to understand what Kissinger was grappling with and why he made the decisions that he did and what he was trying to do. Um, I don't have a brief for, the, I can't remember the guy's name who wrote the book or, or Bass. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, or the essay in response. Um, but those things always need to be looked at kind of carefully. In terms of um, the Serbs in Bosnia, yeah, you know what happened there was that um, we essentially unleashed the Croats, and the Croats engaged in their own ethnic cleansing. I think it was 300,000 Serbs that were basically expelled from their homes in the course of a weekend, um, and many of them died. And that was done uh, with American uh, uh, sponsorship. Right. So it's, you know, these things uh, are messy. And uh, uh, ultimately, you're better to fall back on what is our national interest and uh, not get involved in these matters unless it affects our national interest. And the other thing I'll say about that is, I mean, okay, I understand we have a, we have a volunteer army. But the question is, how much American blood uh, are we willing to expend for this or that cause? And what justifies that? Um, and if you're talking about the parents of a young woman killed in Afghanistan, um, you know, it's worth, go back and read some of B Bismarck said. Now Bismarck was a blood and iron uh, um, chancellor, right? But, but uh, he talked a lot about the agony of seeing young uh, Germans young Prussians uh, uh, lying dead on battlefields, and that leaders have a responsibility to think about what justifies the expenditure of, of blood of the, of the country's young people. And I think that that maybe deserves more attention than it's gotten. But your, your points are all very, very valid in, in, from a debating standpoint. Uh, you mentioned that part of our failure in the Iraq war was due to us not recognizing their cultural differences. And I'm just wondering how much of our own internal struggles right now, be it politics or whatever, are a result of similar cultural differences between various parts of our nation. That's a whole other uh, subject area <laughs> which should be a subject for another speech. Um, I think that the country is, is in, in a severe deadlock, political deadlock, that has multiple facets to it, uh, and much of it is cultural. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it would not be uh, untoward or, or unrealistic to suggest that there's, the country is sort of locked in a political crisis right now, and I think that's contributing to it. There are other elements to it as well, the dysfunction of Washington, some institutional things that have occurred that are contributing to that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that we are in kind of a cultural clash in America. Um, and uh, a lot of things are going on in terms of changes in uh, demographics and sensibility and cultural views, uh, social views uh, that uh, are hard for a lot of people to accept. So yeah, I think you're, you're right, there's intensity there. Do you think that the increased power of the federal government has anything to do with that? Uh, I think that the increased power of the federal government is a very significant um, point of contention for a lot of Americans, whereas it's not a point of contention for many, many others. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's contributing to this, this ferment uh, that I talk about. We didn't let okay. any grown-ups ask questions, but, but we're, a, we're a small group, and so we're going to dismiss and move into the, uh, into the foyer where maybe we'll sell a book or two, or we'll sign them anyway, and uh, thank you all for coming. See you Monday night. Randall will give us more to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.